The title of the message this morning is Come Out of the Cave. Come Out of the Cave. I want to share with you this morning how to deal with issues in your life that seem to keep reappearing. I want to touch on how to deal with issues or circumstances that are on your control, beyond your control. I want to share with you on how to deal with life when life hasn't turned out the way that you planned it. It seems like when people deal with difficult situations, difficult people, difficult situations, our normal responses are anger, disappointment, added stress, or people immediately will run to a desert island or for the sake of the message today, to a cave and they go there to hide. In the Old Testament, we can read quite often about caves. The first example is with Abraham's nephew, Lot. Do you remember when Lot was warned by God to get out of Sodom and Gomorrah? At the time he was warned, Lot was sitting at the city gate. The city gate is very significant in the Bible because that's where the city's officials met to make all the financial decisions and decisions according to the village or town or city that they live in. So the city gates, every time you read that in your Bible, is very significant of a time of decision-making with the leaders of the town and also judicial decisions that they'll make there. So I want you to read Genesis 19 with me. I want you to go to verse 12 and 13 as we pick up the story. The two men said to Lot, and the two men again are two angels that God sent to Lot, uh, to warn him and his family that Sodom and Gomorrah is going to be destroyed by God. Uh, remember God and Abraham were going back and forth. You know, if there's 50 guys, God, would you keep us righteous 50 people? Gets it down to 10. Um, and so now we're at the story where the two men said to Lot, Do you not have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here. Verse 13, because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. And in the story, um, there's son-in-laws that are involved, but the son-in-laws thought their father-in-law, who was Lot, was just kidding. He was just messing with them. And so the son-in-laws never made it out um, because they didn't believe their father-in-law. And so Genesis 19, 17 says this, slip down to verse 17. As soon as they had brought them out, one of them said, Flee for your lives, don't look back, and don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, or you will be swept away. So as they fled, the angels warned them, Escape for your life, do not look behind, do not stay anywhere in the valley, escape to the mountains, or be swept away. Lot obeyed God and did what God told them to do, but Lot's wife, unfortunately, is known for turning back and God turned her into a pillar of salt. Now go to Genesis, uh, stay in chapter 19, but slip down to verse 23 as the story continues. By the time Lot reached Zor, the sun had risen over the land. Then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus he overthrew more cities in the entire plain, including all those living in the cities and also the vegetation and land. But Lot's wife looked back and she became a pillar of salt. Verse 27, early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. He looked, he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and brought Lot out of the catastrophe and overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. Now in your Bible, I want you in that text, I want you to try to pinpoint these two words. And these two words that I want to bring to your attention are the two words saying, looked back, looked back. And look back here in, in the Hebrew, it means this, uh, is someone who is like glancing over their shoulder. If someone's not looking back, like turning around completely like this, but it's someone who's just like glancing over their shoulder. It's almost like making a lane change when you're on Interstate 4. And be careful on Interstate 4 because of all the accidents there. But when people make lane changes, it's almost like they're glancing back, doing a shoulder check, or they're looking in their mirror to make sure it's safe to do it. So Lot's wife did a glance back, and it means to 
Uh, regard something, it means to take under considerate uh, consideration, pay attention. And we know that Lot's wife was disobedient and was uh, so attached to her old life. She was so attached to her old life that she was disobedient to God. And by glancing back in her disobedience is why God changed her into a pillar of salt. And look in Genesis 19, verse 26. But Lot's wife looked back. And she became a pillar of salt. Now, I think the word pillar there, we're going to stop for a moment and just pause on the word pillar. Because why is this woman, who we don't know her name, Mrs. Lot, why is she called a pillar of salt? Why can't she just be a woman of salt? Or why can't she just be like, speaking about her just salt? The word pillar in the Hebrew, uh, pillar means a garrison. And think of something military. Think about many men that fill a garrison. And so, and it's something to get to watch over something else. So the image of Lot's wife, this is interesting, because the image of Lot's wife standing there turned into a pillar of salt. Um, she was able to watch over the Dead Sea area, where to this day in the Dead Sea is where no life exists. So it also reminds us to remember in our lives not to always look back at our former life. Our former life, we have lessons to learn from life experiences, our mistakes we made, that's fine. But we don't need to look back. God wants us to be about the present, and he wants us to press forward and go on towards Jesus Christ and go on because everything is new. So after Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot became despondent towards God. Lot became a little bit angry towards God. And his what how it affected him, his faith became weak. And he became fearful and depressed. And in his travel, leaving that area and despondent with God, he went into a cave. Look at 19 verse 30. Lot and his two daughters left Zor and settled into the mountains, for he was afraid to stay in Zor. He and his two daughters lived in a cave. So in this cave, you have a weak lot, a despondent lot towards God. He has his two daughters. What he knows of civilization was already destroyed by the hand of God because of all the unrighteous, sinful people in these cities. And so Lot's world is caving in, no pun intended, but Lot's world is caving in. And it seems like the four walls of the cave were getting smaller. Have you ever felt that way in your life, that life was squeezing you so hard that the walls seemed like they were coming in on you? Well, listen to this. Fear is false evidence appearing real. Let me say this again. Fear, which comes from the enemy, doesn't come from God. In his cave, he was fearful. In our lives, if we become fearful, and fearful what it does, it tries to dismiss faith in our lives, and we want more faith, less fear. So fear is false evidence, which appears to be real. Fear is a dark room where people can develop their own negatives. Fear will paralyze a Christian from God's dreams, purposes, and even his very destiny that he has for you. The enemy loves when a child of God retreats. The enemy loves when a child of God gives up or heads for a cave. Because in that cave, what's waiting for him in that cave is going to be fear, it's going to be depression, anxiety, darkness and, and discouragement everything's in that cave and it seems like in the bible over and over again when god's people were in trouble like the israelites when they were often invaded by the philistines or another enemy the hebrews would run a lot of times into the mountains especially into caves to hide now i'm thinking about the time of gideon the book of Judges, in chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, says this. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for several years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. 
Because of the power of Midian that was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Now, too many people of God allow fear to drive them into hiding. The normal reaction to that is for some people to run and hide in the cave when tough situations start to happen. Now, church people, we don't go and hide in physical caves, but we will surely go hide in emotional caves. And people run to caves of depression, caves of isolation, caves of taking on an offense, or running to a cave when life gets tough. Now, in my opinion, there are two great dangers of the running into a cave. And we can see in Joshua chapter 10, verse 16 and 18, it says this. This is an awesome story about uh, what Joshua is dealing with. And Joshua 10, 16 and 18 says, Now the Maccabee kings had fled and hidden in the cave. When Joshua was told that the five kings had been hiding in the cave at Maccabee, he said, Roll large rocks up to the mouth of the cave and post some men there to guard it. So, what happened is, is that they went in there to hide. That was their intentions. These kings went in there to hide, to protect themselves. But if we remain, this is important now, we go into a cave to hide, to protect ourselves. But if we stay in that cave, the emotional or spiritual cave and a negative con con uh, sense of it, then what happens is our hiding place turns into a prison. What meant to be a hiding place to get away from things and to protect ourselves, if we stay too long and our season is extended, what happens is our hiding place all but can turn into our own prison. The hiding place was transformed into a prison. This is true when we withhold unforgiveness to another. We hide in our heart. This is a true when we allow the root of bitterness to gain momentum and, and turns into anger stress, anxiety, and we go from hiding and withdrawing to be placing ourselves in a prison. So Ephesians 4, verse 31 and 32 says this. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. So if you retreat in a cave to hide and stay there long enough, it's going to turn into a personal prison. But to stand strong with the armor of God that he provides on the back side of the armor. So people that want to go and hide and get out of the caves, they are basically not, they're going in. I know pain, I know rejection, I know betrayal. If the enemy can convince you that God and the church or your family or friends have given up on you, you will hide and it will turn into a prison. Some people will go hide in that cave and get filled with depression. Some people will hide in fear. Some people hide because they don't want to be hurt or they're willing to talk, talk to anyone and they're willing to take the risk to love again. Back in Joshua's story, back in chapter 10, it started out as a hiding place for the kings, but then for the kings it turned into prison. And then Joshua called them out and Joshua said this, Come out of that cave! This is what he said to his enemies. Come out of that cave. So they came out of their hiding place, which turned into a prison because Joshua has surrounded them with his soldiers. Joshua told all of his commanders then, as soon as those kings came out, I want you to place your foot upon their neck. You have the five kings now on the ground, subjugated to the authority of Joshua and his men. Joshua is not even doing this. He delegated this to his generals to go put their foot on the enemy's neck to show them how low they are and how surrendered they are and they're succumbed to because of their authority. So Joshua told his commanders to do it. They go ahead and do it. And then Joshua 10, 26, Then Joshua struck and killed the kings and hung them on five trees. They were left hanging on the five trees until the morning. Now here's the king's progressions. They went to hide in the cave to get away from Joshua. Good hiding place. But it turned into a prison. Why? 
It's because Joshua called them out. After he called them out, he had them hung. And then what happened then? It turned into a grave. So it turned into a hiding place. Not all that bad to get away from your enemy. A hiding place. Stayed there too long. Your, enemy, your, your conquerors come. It's now turned into a prison. Now Joshua kills them. So we got a hiding place to a prison. And now we got a grave. Hiding place, prison, now a grave. Throws their bodies back into the cave and tells his soldiers this. Put the rocks back over the entrance. They're now in a grave. Hiding, prison, grave. The message to the church is if you have an unforgiving attitude, depression, or suicidal thoughts, or an unforgiving spirit, it can send you into a hiding place called a cave. And if you stay there too long, you're going to be in prison. If you stay there too long, either someone's going to take your life, you're going to take your own. And it's going to turn into a grave. This morning, the message from the Holy Spirit is come out of the cave with the power of the Holy Spirit. Come out of the cave with the promises of God's word and confess who you are in Christ. The church of Jesus Christ has to know who you are. Your identity is not in your job. It's not in your possessions. It's not in your financial report. It's not in anything of status you are. You're famous or not famous. That is not your identity. Your identity is in Christ and how much he loves you and values you. That's who you are. And if you don't believe me, listen to this. Speaking, I am complete in him who is the head. I am alive in Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I am God's child. I am God's workmanship. I am loved of the Lord. I am free. I am justified through Christ Jesus. I have been bought by the blood of Jesus. I am a citizen of heaven. I heard in Christ I am more than a conqueror and I can do all things who strengthens me. That's who you are, church, in Christ Jesus. Amen. Now you will miss God's perfect plan, dreams and purpose for your life because it will die and it can turn into a grave. Elijah and Obadiah, this is another example. Elijah and Obadiah feared the Lord, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Obadiah, that's idolatry and wickedness. Doesn't that sound like America today? Where are the preachers? In America, where are the courageous, anointed, bold preachers preaching against sin, hatred, unethical politics, cohabitation, abortion, racism, and same-sex marriages. Where are the preachers? Where were the preachers? Elijah was saying, where are the preachers today in our land? King Ahab and Jezebel are going crazy. Sin is running rampant, and you're hiding in caves? Amen. That's right. Are the preachers in the United States hiding in caves and being afraid that they have to be politically correct and not to worry about having big budgets and big churches and big church attendance? Otherwise, they're afraid to say something that's going to offend somebody. I want to tell you, from this pulpit of Sacred Fire Church, whoever stands behind this pulpit, we are going to preach the whole Bible and everything to say, and we're not going to be politically correct. Amen. They responded to Elijah, shh, we're in a cave. We're in a cave. A silent preacher might as well be a dead preacher. When a nation is in a crisis, the silent pulpit is not God's pulpit. Romans 5, 20, 21, the law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that is just sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness to bring the eternal life through those of Christ Jesus our Lord. The question is, where are the preachers with uncompromising power and authority in the American pulpits today? Preachers need to preach the whole Bible without being worried about being politically correct. We all know without authority and power from on high, preachers' words can be lifeless. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God that brings salvation to those, first to the Jew and to the Gentile. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, 
I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligent of the intelligence. I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. The Jews demand signs. The Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the next Gentiles. Lord, send. Lord, anoint. Lord, select and rise up the next generation of Jeremiah's and Isaiah's to call a nation to repentance. Rise up the Jeremiah's, rise up the Isaiah's to call our nation to repentance. Arise the next Esther's and the next Ruth for this generation. Arise the next Paul and Peter for this generation who didn't let martyrdom silence them. Arise John the Baptist and Stephen for this generation. Arise the next Billy Graham leading many to Christ in this generation. We need to bring back the old-time religious brothers who rode on horseback to communicate the gospel who said, Give me a hundred preachers who fear nothing. I will fight against sin and desire nothing more but God, and I will shake the gates of hell. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, I'm excited about you guys. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, My message and my preaching were not with wise and pervasive words, but with the demonstrations of the Spirit's power, so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Christians and the pulpits of America, we can't afford about being so diplomatic and so politically correct, watching people in our nation dying, going to hell. It is time for the men of God, women of God, young people to stand up for the Bible, stand up for your faith, stand up for morality, stand up for the unborn, stand up for Israel, stand up for the U.S. flag, stand up for biblical purity, stand up for marriage between a man and a woman, stand up for holiness, stand up for prayer, and it's time for the church to come out of its cave. It's time for the church to come out of its cave because everyone else has, but it's time for the church to come out of its cave. We need to go after the God of the Bible, rely on the Holy Spirit and ask God for wisdoms to make decisions. And Holy Spirit, please, please, please break our hearts for the lost. When is the last time you cried for the lost? When's the last time you were broken for the lost? Elijah's message at that time in this text said, you know what, guys? You can stay in your caves. God hasn't called me or the 21st century church to be a cave dweller. God has called us to be kingdom dwellers. Elijah said, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to confront Ahab. The reference for that is 1 Kings 18, verses 18 through 40. I'm not going to read all this too long, but Elijah told Israel, I do not make trouble for you with God. You did not follow in his commands. Bring all the people of Israel and meet me at Mount Carmel. Bring the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. Ahab organized everyone. Elijah said to God's people, how long will you waver between the two? But if it is Baal, is God, follow him. If it is the Lord, is God, follow him. This is what's being communicated right now to the church today. You're either going to serve God or you're not going to serve God. There's a line being drawn in the sand. You're going to serve God, then serve God with all of your heart. If you're not going to serve God, then that's the way it goes. Elijah was one left, was the only one left of the Lord's prophets. Baal had 450 prophets. Elijah said this, go get two bulls. And Baal's people cut him into pieces, placed him on the wood. Elijah took the other bull, did the same. Elijah said, call on the name of the God, on your God. So they tried. And he says, the God who answers with fire, he is God. Baal's people called upon their God from morning till noon. No answer. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Where's your God? You're not shouting loud enough. Where's your God? Oh, he must be traveling somewhere on business. Where's your God? He must be too busy or in deep thought. So what did these people do that didn't worship our God of the Bible? They slashed themselves in their custom until their blood filled. They still had no answers until the God of fire showed up. And the fire came down. And that was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that is the God that we serve today. The last example I want to share with you is in Exodus 2. Moses was called to bring God's people out of Egypt. 
He got the conviction and stirring when he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. So Moses killed the Egyptian. When Pharaoh found out, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled out into the desert, into the wilderness, to go live in a cave. Moses was a shepherd for 40 years. Moses entered into a cave now of contentment. People say it's kind of like, you know what, I'm content, let someone else do it. I don't want to do it anymore. I'm good. Sunday mornings is all I really need to do. But just before Moses' cave, it became a prison in the grave. God appeared to him to a burning bush. God sent a fire to purge and challenge Moses, told him to come out of the cage of failure, of doubt, come out of the cave of sadness, come out to a higher calling, come out to a higher ground. You see, I believe that God has called us and destined us to do things mighty and higher calling and higher ground for him. Now, the last one I want to share with you, and I'm going to skip ahead here, is going to be about Naaman. And Naaman, it's an interesting story, because Naaman was a general and he was, in, he was a Syrian, but he was dying of leprosy. And Naaman... Um, had a maidservant who was a Hebrew girl. He probably found her and is using her to be a slave girl, maybe over one of the other that he conquered in a, in a battle. He kidnapped her. Now he was a slave girl. But she was a Hebrew slave girl who believed in God. And Naaman's dying, and she says to him, there's a prophet in the land, and I want you to go to this prophet, and he's in Samaria. If you go to this prophet, this prophet can heal you. The God, his God will heal you. And Naaman didn't want to hear anything about it. And finally, through some people talking to him, finally convinced him to make this journey. And this journey was about at least 120 miles away. So a man dying of leprosy has to travel that distance. I don't know, in a wagon or on a horseback. I don't know his transportation, but it was a great distance to go when someone who was dying of leprosy. And when he gets there, he's probably thinking, I'm this famous general and this you know, famous guy, and I have all this wealth and money, all these soldiers listen to me. When I get there, the, the prophet, Elisha, he should probably have a big parade for me and just big circumstance and have all these things. And here, here I come. And what, what he finds, what Naaman finds, is the prophet was not very friendly. Just the opposite of what he expected. And when he gets there, the prophet tells him, to go do something very unusual. He says, I want you to go down to the Jordan River. Now, the Jordan River from Samaria, where the prophet was speaking with Elijah, was still another 30 miles. He already traveled 120. Comes to an unfriendly prophet. Gets mad at the prophet and starts saying, there's a river closer and names the rivers. There's other rivers that are closer. And matter of fact, they're cleaner than the Jordan River. Don't we do that with God a lot of times? But God, couldn't you do this? Couldn't you do that? So it's easier for us, more convenient for us. And so this is what Naaman's doing. Finally, someone whispers in his ear and he listens to him and says, you know what, do what the prophet tells you. What do you got to lose? He makes the journey, he goes to the Jordan River. Seven times he dips, just as the prophet told him. On the seventh time, he comes out of the water and he's pumped up. He is excited because he has his life back. The God of the Bible healed Naaman of leprosy the seventh time he came out of the water, just as the prophet told him so. I can go back to my wife. I can go back to my kids and my grandkids. I can go back being a general. I have my life back. But wait a minute. They don't, they don't worship this God back in Syria. They worshiped this god named Rimmon. And Rimmon was a weather god, basically. And he realized they don't worship the same god. I, have, I need to worship the god that just healed me. So it's amazing. He goes back to the River Jordan, and on the, on the river banks, he has two mules with him, and he starts digging and digging and digging, and he puts all the soil and mud and everything into the saddlebags of these mules and takes the mules back with him, and what is he taking back with him to? The God of the Bible. 
He's taken back with him the God of Abraham and Isaac and Zayab, but he wants to take back the soil so he can always remember. And this is an amazing thing what he does. When he gets into the temple and everyone else is worshiping the false gods, this is what Naaman does. I'm going to go to my saddlebag. Because I remember what the God of the Bible did for me. And he does this. He grabs as much as he can. And he comes over and right smack in the middle of the temple. And he throws down the dirt from the Jordan River. And he throws the dirt down, and the dirt's right there. And he says, I'm going to go over here and worship on the dirt of the God of the Bible who saved me, who healed me. And he's standing on higher ground right in the middle of the enemy's camp. And he's worshiping God. Amen. It's an amazing story. So this morning, in conclusion... You need to come out of the cave. If you're in the cave, emotionally, spiritually dry, it's time to come out. Now here's another thought. What if you happen to know somebody who's in the cave? You're not in the cave, but you know someone who's in the cave. Go in that cave with love not with a 30-pound King James Bible with you. But go to that person in the cave who is hiding, for whatever reason, hurting, and reach them before it turns into a prison for them or a grave. So here's the responsibility of the church. For example, Ingrid's in the cave. I'm coming in. And I'm not going to throw a thousand scriptures that I learned at Junior Bible Quiz or Teen Bible Quiz. I'm going to come in as a Christian man filled with love and grace. And I might not have to say a word for her, but I'm going to come and I'm going to be present with her. I'm going to stand with her in her pain in the cave. And then what we're going to do over time through prayer that we're going to come out of the cave together. And that's the church's responsibility. You can go back to your cave. <laughs> that's the church's responsibility. If you know some, a family member, friend, that's in the cave, don't do this. Hi, Ingrid, how you doing? I'm praying for you. Who does that remind you of? The parable of the Good Samaritan? Right? Or can I write you a check? And, and give it to her so it meet her needs. Anybody can write a check. Anybody can just walk by and say, I'm praying for you. But can you do this? Jesus with skin on, Pastor Shannon. And get right in there. Get in the cave. So that's for somebody we know that's in the cave. Let's be active to do that. That's ministry. That's personal ministry. Wouldn't you want someone to come do that for you? Well, let's stand together. Coming out of your cave means where you're standing is just a point of an act of faith only. To come to the altar means that you have walked out of your cave. In your cave, it may be filled with depression, suicidal thoughts, cutting yourself, drug addiction, alcoholism, gossip, brokenness, crushed spirit. You're hiding in that cave to protect yourself because I don't want to be hurt anymore. And you hear people in the cave, I don't want to be hurt anymore. Would you just leave me alone? No, we're not going to leave you alone. So you make a decision. If you feel that you're in the cave emotionally or spiritually, today is your coming out day. And by coming to the altar and spending time with the Lord, He's going to touch you in such a special way that you will never go back to that cave. And how many people know right now who's in the cave? You know someone who's in the cave? Raise your hand. You know someone who's in the cave right now? Then you come and intercede for that person that you know that's in the cave. You come out for them. 
you stand in the gap for them. So if you need to come out of your cave, you come right now. If you need to pray for someone who's in a cave, you come right now. standing with me in the congregation I want you to come and stand behind those that are here and put your hand on their shoulder because you are showing them that they're never alone that you're going to stand with them in prayer as they come out of their cave so come on let's come up here and put a hand on them 